Hello, today we're going to be working on a Marantz SD420 cassette deck from around about the late 80s I believe it was. This is a machine I bought for myself when I was a youngster and it still works. It's a beautiful piece of kit uh, but we need to change the drive belts. I've also made a modification to it. Let's have a look. So here we have the SD420. I'm afraid it is sporting some scratches. It's uh, been around for many years. As was common for Marantz equipment, it's a, this design of thirds. So you have a third with a cassette deck, a third with uh, display, and a third with controls. I'm not sure I particularly like that layout, but that's the way it was. It's actually a really well-made piece of kit. It's really battleship grade inside. So it's had a new set of belts some probably 15, 20 years ago, and they have degraded. Now there's something else going on here. You can see this Iowa remote control. Let me show you something. This machine was originally built with a remote control socket, but I um, had access to a number of these from uh, an employer when I was uh, a teenager. And I took this one and modified the wiring inside so that it uh, has this plug on and I fitted this extra socket. And this is a sort of passive thing. You can send it um, the, the, the key functions and it'll work. But this one's better. It feeds back to the LEDs on here. So if you see me select play, the uh, play light lights up. It's a bit bright in here, but the lights do actually work, which is a, a nice feature. So you'll see my little circuit to do that. That's something I fitted way back when I was a youngster. Now, what we have in here is a Wham Flutter cassette. Uh, I really don't think this is a very good Wow and Flutter cassette, and I think roughly half of the Wow and Flutter I'm reading when I connect this, uh, use this on uh, more expensive decks, about half the value of Wow and Flutter I think is coming from the cassette itself. But uh, have a quick look at uh, what figures we get. I'll just, oops, that's the power button, right? I select play, the play light comes on there, and we have a Wow and Flutter reading. You can hear the sound. And it's around about 0.2. Uh, and I think we can get around about 0.1 out of this machine, probably. It's only a two-head deck. It's not three-head. But um, what I like this machine for is that sometimes when one of my more expensive Iowa machines won't play a really sticky tape that for some reason is really heavy to turn, this machine will play it anyway. It just uh, is such an industrial-grade piece of kit. Right, let's open it up and see what's going on inside. So there's our machine. Um, I think I'll set you up so you're looking down on it and get a better view. Let's take a look around. So power supply here, we have multi-voltage uh, selector there. Going to this large transformer on the left-hand side. So they've tried to split the um, signals and the power supply. And go across to the deck here, so it's a twin motor design, so one motor looks after the flywheel capstan and the other motor deals with uh, the um, take-up for the the, spin, the spools. So that's a, a nice design, that's a better way of doing it than having a, a slipping clutch arrangement connected to the capstan motor. Over here on the right hand side is our signals, this is um, I have a big board here, which I'm fairly sure is Dolby board. Yes, that will be because it has Dolby um, part numbers on the ICs. Any 654. Now, you know we don't have Dolby on any new cassette decks, and the reason is that uh, it's said that's because you can't buy the chips anymore, but that's actually not true. The real reason is that um, Dolby Labs uh, are not licensing Dolby for any more cassette decks. Looking down here, there's a front panel PCB, which uh, just takes the uh, the buttons and lights. And you can also see here there's a mechanical tape counter. Then at the bottom we have signals and also uh, system control. And then this is my little board here that I fitted all those many decades ago, which uh, is a set of transistors. Uh, which drives the LEDs on the remote control. Uh, I could have used an IC, uh, but for whatever reason I used discrete transistors. It was a very long time ago. So this is the wiring that goes to the, uh, the main board to both provide the switching signals from the remote and drive the LEDs. 
uh, to correspond to the LEDs on the front panel. Now I have a set of uh, drive belts which I've ordered from USA. These drive belts I've had hanging around since um, October last year so I really should get around to installing these. Hopefully they're uh, easy to install. This is the servo motor which is involved of course in the capstan operation so when I've installed it I'm going to have a very very small tweak I think of the speed control on the back of that uh, to set the speed up. I think it's running a tiny tiny bit fast. Now if we look here as the machine is running take a look at the existing um, main drive belt the one for the capstan. I'll zoom you in a bit. So uh, looking at the existing drive belt it's amazing that the wow and flutter figures are as good as they are when you look at the state of that drive belt it's um, wobbling about something awful so that really needs replacement. It's many years since I last worked on this machine I don't know how to disassemble it but I'll do the obvious thing I think initially and take the uh, front panel off. Looking at the capstan motor it appears that the two screws here hold this bracket on and then it should be possible to pull this whole motor and bracket out of the way to let us to replace the, the main belt here. The other belt I see is this one going to the counter from the take-up spool but that looked quite hard to get to and the kit uh, has three belts so I'm not quite sure how that works. There's something else. I've seen some other versions of this machine with a different eject mechanism where you press this and the door comes out and then opens. So uh, it might be that I don't necessarily have the right belts for this machine. Oh. Now how would I get this belt replaced anyway on the um, going between the take-up spool and the counter? That looks really awkward because this door is in the way. Here. And I think the only way to do it might be to kind of spring these off these posts and that might give me the access I need. But I need to be careful because there is actually a spring here connecting uh, the fixed part of the deck to the door. It's part of the damping. So that could be a little fiddly to put back. But I don't see any alternative if I want to get in behind here to just pushing these off their pillars. So I'm going to give that a shot. Like that. That's one side done. Almost. There we go. Well that's not giving me much better access but I can just about get in here behind the uh, take-up spool so I'm hoping I can uh, replace that belt now but it may be the belt I have in the kit does not fit anyway. Okay well let's release the belt from the um, counter end that's easy that's there and then from the take-up spool end I can probably just fish it out. Okay, so we have the uh, the belt out. It's a very thin belt, and these are the belts that came in the kit, which are no help at all in this case. So uh, there clearly are two versions of this deck. Let's uh, replace that with something from my spare parts kit. Okay, I found a belt which I believe is suitable. It's just a few percent smaller and it's a similar, similar sort of uh, size. This came from my uh, general drive belt collection. Of course, this shouldn't be too critical anyway, provided it doesn't cause oscillations in the uh, take up tension. It shouldn't be critical to the uh, performance of the deck. Right, I've got the uh, belt fitted across the uh, take up pulley and then you feed it through this slot here over to the pulley at the back. I know you can't quite see what I'm doing but actually neither can I. Right, it's working but I just want to make sure that the belt is sat 
actually on the correct sort of channel on the uh, take up spool. So I now have the uh, drive belt sitting in the groove at the, uh, the back of that take up spool. It is just, just so awkward to get to, but uh, I'm fairly sure that's now correct. So um, I'll put this back on its uh, correct locations here. That one's in. Right, I may have bent this bracket very, very slightly. You know, like a fuffle, so I'm just going to bend that back again. That's good. So the bracket's now parallel with the chassis there. This one didn't bend. Good. And check that the uh, counter's running. That looks perfect. So as I turn the uh, take up spool, you can see the counter is rotating. There's a drive surface I can see on an idler. So this motor here has a, um, a shaft which bears on an idler with a rubber tire on it. And you could, if you had a lack of fast forward or rewind, uh, improve that idler surface with some platen clean or similar but I'm fairly sure that the fast forward and rewind performance of this machine is absolutely fine so I won't do that so next we'll go into battle with the capstan motor which can only be easy compared to what we've just done with the uh, counter to the point that I wouldn't actually recommend changing that counter belt really okay so that gives me quite good access to the um, capstan motor Okay, that's the bracket. This is clearly a bearing for the capstan. So I can probably actually pull the capstan out. No, must have a washer on the other side. Oh no, it is. It does have a plastic sort of retainer. at the front it's well it's a it's a oil a grease trap actually that retainer I've seen those before so if taking the capstan out you need to be wary of that and put it back in the right place okay so that's the retainer at the front of the capstan so we need to keep that safe and refit it So I can put a little, I can take the opportunity to give this the capstan the best clean it's ever had in its life and a drop of um, uh, light machine oil on the shaft there and also clean up this surface that the belt runs on. Clearly it's worth cleaning this up because that's going to have a direct uh, impact on the wear and flutter performance. Okay, I've... Um, Clean that and put a little light oil on the base of this. I can refit that and clean it again from the other side because, of course, it will likely pick up a little bit of oil and refit this, uh, refit this retainer come oil trap on the front of the capstan.
this grease here, I'm not sure I want to replace it. Or should it just be redistributed so that the shaft sits on it better? I think we'll just redistribute the grease that's there like that. Because I don't think I'd have any grease of exactly the right specification for that. We wouldn't know what the specification was. So what I'm inclined to do now, I think, is I will actually release this motor and give a drop, give that a drop of oil on the uh, shaft entrance there to the bearing. It appears you don't have to undo the screws completely, just slacken them off, I think, and then rotate this, I believe. There we go, and it'll come off like that. I could take the pulley off to get better access. I'm just worrying about whether I can set it to exactly the same height as it was. I could measure it. Okay, from the top of the pulley to the body is reading 14.3 millimetres. And I believe I can lock this off here. Yeah? 14.3, 14.4. So I could fit it back into exactly the same spot. But I'll need a... Um, Allen key small enough to fit that grub screw. Yes, that's 1.5 millimeter Allen key. We'll quiet that. Okay, so I can now oil that uh, bearing. Okay, I've cleaned the um, pulley as well to remove any old belt debris on that one. You can now refit the uh, motor to its bracket. You need to re-engage the bracket at the, uh, the far end here. Yeah, that feels like it's correct. So I can now fit the new belt and put the bracket in place with the new belt. Right, so I have the belt on the capstan flywheel. The bracket roughly in place, but the screw's not done up. Now I need to hook the belt up on the uh, motor, which is a little fiddly, but uh, should be possible. Right, so I've got to fit these screws in this awkward position at the back of the bracket here. Right, I've done the first one up loosely with a small screwdriver and I'll do them up tightly with a big screwdriver shortly. I'm happy now that this belt is fitted nicely so that if I rotate the um, flywheel you can see it's all the belt is all running smoothly on the, uh, the motor pulley. We'll finish off by uh, cleaning the heads and the capstan and pinch roller. You see that I'm cleaning the raise head even though I've got no intention of making recordings on this because you don't want uh, tape oxide anywhere on the tape path. Refit the front panel. Important to make sure the recording level controls at the bottom so they'll engage with the uh, sliders which will also of course sit at the bottom. Shame about all these scratches. I'll just fit one screw at the moment and we'll do a test on it, get it set up. Right, first thing I'll do is make sure it works with any old cassette before I put this uh, wire and flutter tape in. Even though I don't think this is a particularly good wire and flutter tape, I still don't want to damage it. So I'll put this tape in. Start with fast forward. Mm, a little noisy, could be smoother, but clearly working. Rewind. Now oh, that is struggling a little. That's all a bit disappointing. We'll try play, just see if that works. Right, that's working. But I don't think I can leave fast forward and rewind in that condition. Very, very little rewind. So I'm going to have, a, have to look at the um, idler assembly, which is a little awkward to get to. But OK, let's do that. 
So remember the idler is, this is the uh, real drive motor. So the idler sits uh, beneath that, behind this very awkwardly mounted metal plate, which I'm going to spring out the way again. With that plate just pushed out the way, I can barely get to the idler, which is right there. But there's a, there's a rubber um, tire on the plastic idler there. And I think the pulley on the motor is not rubber surfaced, but I'll have to have a closer look. Okay, it appears that they're both rubber surfaced, and it's actually the one on the motor pulley that looks to be most worn. But uh, all I can do is apply some of this uh, platen clean and hope that it gives it a little bit more grip. Okay, I've done that, and I think it's working because when I first started, I could rotate the motor without the uh, idler really going around that much. And by the time I'd finished, I was struggling to clean the motor because the idler was sticking to it better. Let's uh, refit this uh, front. Okay, we'll try that again then. Start with fast forward. Certainly sounds a bit better. Stop, rewind. No. I might just leave it fast forwarding that tape for a little while and see if that platen cleaner can work in a bit. Well, no, it's still struggling to rewind all the way to the beginning of the tape. And I think the reason is that the, uh, as well as the fact there's wear on that pulley, is that the drive belt for the counter, being a new and slightly thicker in this case drive belt, is applying a little bit more load on the uh, take up spool. And as it gets to the beginning of the tape as it's rewinding, the larger amount of tape on this spool amplifies the amount of rotation of this, so that amplifies the drag it's feeling from that belt. So maybe I shouldn't have changed the counter belt at all, and maybe I'd say to somebody who was doing this job, if you don't need to change the counter belt, don't. Almost tempted to change it back again. Will it rewind further if I swap back to the original belt? It's a painful experiment to try, but I think I should. Okay, so my uh, replacement belt is slightly shorter and slightly thicker than the original. So we'll go back to the original. Okay, I've uh, refitted the uh, original tape counter belt because it was functional anyway and I think it's applying a lot less load. So let's see if we can rewind from this point where it wouldn't allow me to rewind any further just now. It's rewinding nicely. So even though we have a problem with the pulley on this motor, the biggest impediment to rewind is the uh, counter belt. So we'll leave that well alone if we don't need to replace it. So we do have the problem that if you do need to replace it, uh, if you have that variety of deck which takes two belts, I think there's um, another pulley in between, then fine, you can use those, but otherwise you're going to have to source a belt from somewhere else. Right, with that now working a lot better, I'll reassemble it and we can do wow flutter test and uh, check the speed. Right, I've uh, started that running. I'm afraid I can't do a direct video capture for this uh, from this computer, but you can see that uh, wow flutter is somewhat less than it was before. But what I'm going to do is just leave the machine running as, uh, and on another tape actually leave it playing and come back to it after the new belt has had little time to uh, settle in. So we have this machine running now. I just wanted to show you a couple of the features on this actually. One is track skip. Um, we could do it with this button here or my copy one on this remote. I'll show you on this remote. So if you're playing a track and you don't want to listen to it anymore, press that once and it'll uh, you can skip to the next track and you can press it multiple times to skip forward or backwards. Another trick uh, is, which I've been using for testing, you press play, of course it goes into play normally, press play again, it flashes the light and it'll continuously repeat that one track, it'll get to the end and rewind to the beginning of that track and play it again. 
Right, so I'm now going to hook this up to um, do the wear and flutter measurements. The computer that I was using for that uh, blew up this morning, so I'm going to have to hook it to another machine and give it a whirl. Right, I've got it running with the uh, WF GUI wear and flutter measurement, and I would say that the readings are significantly better than they were prior to changing the belts. Um, it's still occasionally peaking high, but I really don't think much of this actual tape. Uh, I believe the tape itself gives uh, about half of the value I'm seeing. But the RMS value I'm getting is around about 0.08%, something in that area. So uh, that's perfectly acceptable for a machine of this vintage. Right, the last thing I need to do is set the speed because this tape is 3150, or it's supposed to be 3150 hertz uh, on this side, and I'm getting a reading uh, closer to 3000 actually, so it's a fair bit low. It's reading about 3030, so I'm going to uh, adjust the preset on the back of the uh, motor. That's working. Right, we have a, a better frequency, so that's a lot closer to 3150, and the uh, WAN flutter is in the order of 0 0.07, 0 0.08% uh, RMS. Okay, all I need to do now is uh, reassemble it. Right, that's done. It's worth noting this is one of those cassette decks that leaves the capstan motor permanently running when it's powered up. So it's not a machine you want to just leave idling with the power on. It'll eventually uh, cause motor wear. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this. A uh, little bit of work on the Marantz SD420. Um, if you're new to this channel, do watch the outro at the end because you get to see some of the things I do. Uh, please remember to like, share and especially subscribe. And I'll do a lot more content on audio and video technology in the near future. Bye for now.